Hello, this is the message for Daily Chapel Christian Church for March the 24th, 2024, and this is Adam Kaufman, the preacher. Well, over the past few months, we've been unpacking the two lists of spiritual gifts that we find in the New Testament. The first one's in Romans chapter 12, and the second one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, in total, we've covered about 15 gifts that are mentioned between these two lists, uh, though I have combined some of them into single messages instead of giving every one of the gifts uh, its own sermon. Uh, but in some way, we have now covered the gifts of encouragement, leadership and administration, teaching, prophecy, serving and helping, giving, mercy, healing and miracles, tongues and interpretation, discernment, knowledge, and last week we talked about wisdom. Today, we're going to cover the only one left on these lists that we have not talked about, and that is the gift of faith. Now, before we get into this topic today, I do want to mention that even though we are bringing this discussion to a close for our purposes so that we can continue on, uh, through the rest of Romans chapter 12, and then through the rest of the book, uh, it doesn't mean that we have talked about all the spiritual gifts that exist. Uh, in Scripture, we see that there are other ways in which God has uh, gifted people, uh, even though they are not specifically called spiritual gifts. Uh, for that reason, I do not believe that Paul's two lists are exhaustive of the subject, and I don't believe he intended them to be complete lists of all the gifts that exist. The intention behind him bringing up and naming the gifts that he does isn't even to define the gifts themselves, but to illustrate how the church body is made up of many individual parts that work together. Paul's focus in both of these passages uh, uh, that we've been looking at is on the interconnectedness of the church body through the same Holy Spirit, even though we are all different people with unique traits. So when he lists all these specific gifts, he's doing so to give examples of how the Holy Spirit apportions different abilities to all of us so that we can work together in accomplishing the mission of the church as the agents of God's kingdom in this world. Uh, but there are other gifts uh, that are not mentioned in these lists. Patience is a gift. Hospitality is a gift. Uh, hospitality is also a Christian virtue that Paul will talk about uh, before we reach the end of chapter 12. Uh, there are people with gifts of craftsmanship and music and writing and uh, calculation. That's, that's math. Some people are just really good with numbers. Gardening, hunting, fishing, and animal husbandry are gifts that some people have. Uh, natural athletic ability is a gift. Taking care of children is a gift. Taking care of the sick and elderly is a gift. Uh, if it's something that can be used to bring glory to God and point people to Christ and build up the church, uh, provide for others, or further the message of the kingdom in some way, and it comes naturally to you, then it is a gift from God, and you need to use it with that in mind. It's only a matter of recognizing the gifts and leaning into them uh, by asking the Lord to guide us in their use. Most people instinctively know uh, what their gifts are, but if we're not sure, then we can always go to God and ask him and help ask him to help us identify what our gifts are and he will uh, putting our god-given gifts and talents to use for the kingdom is tremendously fulfilling god's uh, god gives us gifts because he intends for us to use them and if we don't use our gifts then we start to you know kind of wither away spiritually speaking i know this from personal experience um, when i think back to uh, various times in my past when I was uh, depressed, 
for when I was feeling a lot of ongoing anxiety for reasons that I couldn't identify at the time, I can recognize now, looking back, that those times where I was feeling anxiety and depression coincided with periods of times where I was not using the gifts that God has given me. I was neglecting my talents and abilities and it caused depression. It caused anxiety due to the buildup of the feeling that I was not fulfilling my purpose for being on this earth. Depression and anxiety, as we know, are two of the biggest money makers in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I know that uh, some people have actual physical conditions or uh, you know, chemical imbalances and such, and they need medication that can help them with that. So I'm not discounting all of that by any means. All I'm saying is that when I have suffered from longer chronic periods of depression and anxiety in my life, it was because I was not fulfilling my purpose in life by using my gifts in service to the king. All I'm saying is that depression and anxiety are not always the result of a physical problem or some kind of mental or chemical imbalance. They can also be the result of a spiritual imbalance. And that's why sometimes, okay, I want to stress sometimes, People get into taking medications and it doesn't really work because the problem isn't physical. It's not mental, it's spiritual. If you take a pill to cure a spiritual problem, it's not going to work and you're going to end up going in circles. And even if it does somehow solve one problem, the root cause, if it, if it is actually a spiritual issue, will resurface and manifest itself in some other way. Now, that's just my opinion, okay? Of course, there are many people, uh, people that are lost, that suffer from depression and anxiety because they're putting their faith in things other than the Lord. Uh, people put their faith in all kinds of things. As human beings, we are designed to have faith. Uh, we are designed to look up to something that is greater than ourselves, um, we look out into this world at the, uh, you know, a world that is at the same time beautiful and terrifying and uh, full of harmony and complexity. And on a clear night, we can even look outside of this world, you know, and get a glimpse of that, which is even more beautiful and more terrifying and harmonious and complex. And it's all way bigger than we are. It demands that we bow down in some way to trust something bigger than ourselves, to put faith in something. Some people actually put faith in the created things. Uh, ancient cultures put their faith in things like the sun and the moon. They put their faith in the thunder and the lightning and the ocean tides, the things that obviously seem to have some kind of energy or power in them. They gave these things names. They worshipped them as gods. And some cultures still do that. But also, in our time, there are now some people who bow down to science as a god. And don't get me wrong about science. Okay, Science and faith are not incompatible, as some people believe. Uh, science can explain many of the intricacies of God's creation. Uh, it can explain a lot of how God has knit this amazing, wonderful universe together. But science cannot explain everything because it is not God. Science fact and science theory are two very different things that sometimes get blended together. And there are a lot of atheists out there who put their faith in science theory. It takes a lot more faith. I believe, uh, to be a complete atheist. Uh, it takes more faith to believe in nothing, that all of this happened by random cosmic occurrence somehow than it does to believe that it happened on purpose with intention. So everyone 
has faith in something. Uh, even people that say they don't believe in anything are putting faith in that belief. And that brings us to the topic of the day, the gift of faith. Now, obviously we've talked about faith before as we've worked our way through Romans. Faith is a major concept in the book of Romans. Uh, it's one of the key words in the whole book. Uh, and faith is really used in a few different ways in Scripture. Uh, there is the faith, that is saving faith in Christ. There is uh, the fruit of faith, and there is the gift of faith. These uses of the word faith are all related to each other. And they have the same root word in Greek, but they are used in slightly different ways. So we should probably define each of these a little more thoroughly. Uh, saving faith is the faith that we put in Christ. It's believing that he has saved us from our sins. We act on that faith. We give it life by confessing our belief to him, by repenting from sin because of him, by getting baptized into him and living in obedience for him. This kind of faith is the blanket term that refers to being a Christian. Saving faith It's what we've talked about most of the time when we've, uh, this topic of faith has come up in Romans previously. It's this kind of faith that we're talking about in general. And this is how Jude uses the word faith in the opening of his letter. Now, there's only one chapter in Jude. And in verse 3 of it, he says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. That's Christianity, or basic fundamental belief in Christ that he's talking about there as a whole when he refers to the faith. Okay, it's faith in Christ. Next, we have the fruit of faith. Okay, we see it described this way in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We translate it as faithfulness in English, but in Greek it's just faith. Um, and because it's a fruit, that means that it can grow. Uh, it's something that we can cultivate and should cultivate. It's something that we can grow in and build upon. We can increase, in other words, in the amount of faith that we have. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, he says that our faith can and should produce other virtues as well. It can grow into things like goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, and love, among other things. And then Peter adds in verse 8 of that chapter, he says, If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, faith is the root of our effectiveness and our productivity in God's kingdom. Another way to think of it is... <clears throat> is that faith means trusting God. Okay. Getting saved is the initial step of trusting in God, but then it takes continuing faith to keep trusting Him, to keep following Christ. An example it makes me think of is uh, when I was about four or five, my parents took my sister and I to get swimming lessons. And... I remember it being very scary at first. The first step was just getting into the water. Uh, and that was only the shallow end. And the lady who was giving us lessons was standing right there in the pool to make sure that we were okay. Uh, the second step was then jumping into the pool instead of easing into it. Again, the instructor was right there to catch us. But eventually... Through increasing steps of faith, the initial challenge of getting into the pool and learning to move were overcome. 
Eventually, by the end of the summer, we were able to swim across the whole pool and back. And the things that were really scary at the beginning of the summer, uh, they were easy. And we didn't even have to think about them by the end. That's like cultivating the fruit of faith. We do it in steps, gradually, through the process that the Lord leads each of us through in life. It looks different for all of us. And we are all at different stages of that, uh, depending on our own experience in following Christ, when we began the journey, and what challenges we've had to face or live through uh, and overcome. Uh, faith is cultivated most often through hardship, through pain and suffering, and and by doing things that we don't necessarily want to do, but doing them anyway because they are the right things to do and because we know that God wants us to do them. But faith can also be a spiritual gift, as Paul points out. Christians who have this gift are able to push forward without wavering in unbelief, without doubting God's presence or his sovereignty, uh, in spite of whatever obstacles may land in their way, because the gift of faith is the gift of overcoming obstacles. That's what it's for. This is the kind of faith that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, when he said, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And the mountain he's talking about there is anything that is a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. Following Christ is a journey that takes us through many hardships, difficulties, and challenges. Many mountains, as Jesus calls them. Some of us struggle to get over those mountains. Uh, but if we don't give up, our faith grows as a result of the struggle. And then we grow some fruit. We make some fruit. But others, others have the gift. And those people don't really see the mountains as obstacles at all. They uh, just see the path that Jesus has cut for them right through the middle of it. And they head on down that path because they know it is the right one. The mountains don't stop them. They barely even slow them down. And that doesn't mean that the mountains are easy. It doesn't mean that the obstacles are easy to overcome. But people who have this gift know what God wants. They know what he is asking them to do. And because he is asking them to do it, they know it will succeed. That's having the gift of faith. These kinds of people are not beset by uh, the normal kinds of fears and concerns that tend to affect many of us. Uh, the present circumstances, however bad things might appear to be, are never as big as the eventual outcome, because God has it all under control anyway. But that means that people with this gift, as with the other gifts, need to have love and humility and concern for others in order to keep their faith from leading to carelessness, recklessness, and pride uh, which it very easily can do. Uh, I've known some people like that in the past. Uh, Christians who had a tremendous gift of faith, but they were maybe a little lacking on the maturity side of things. And they could do great things, and they could go places where Christianity is not common. They could preach the gospel without fear. But they were lacking in the areas of humility and concern for others. And they couldn't see that some of the people they were leading did not have the gift of faith as they did. And those people needed to move at a slower pace because getting past the mountains took a little more work for them. Sometimes Christians with the gift of faith can get frustrated with those who do not have the gift and if they are leaders and they move forward in their frustration too hastily, they can actually damage the faith of others instead of helping them to grow. Uh, so humility, 
love and concern for others are key with this gift as as they are with many of the other gifts um no i think uh, uh and maybe it goes without saying but i think that all of the apostles had the gift of faith uh, we can see it in the fruit uh the fruit that they produced they were fearless they didn't let anything stop them. The only thing that ended their ministries was death. And in their writings, they are constantly building up the church and encouraging those who are not as gifted as them. They were moving forward in faith, but always pausing, in a sense, to look back for a moment and check the progress of those they were leading to make sure everyone was keeping up. Now, of course, uh, of course, the Old Testament has the best stories about people with faith and, and what they accomplished because they knew God was real and that he was with them. Uh, David and Goliath, Samson and the Philistines, Daniel and the lion's den. In any case, those are the three main ways that faith is talked about in the Bible. Faith that saves, faith that grows, and faith that is given. Uh, but then I'm going to give you a bonus one as well. And that one is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. It's the shield of faith. Uh, it's part of the armor of God. Paul, after talking about several of the other pieces of armor, he writes, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Paul was most likely basing his armor analogy uh, on the armor of the Roman soldiers. That's what he, you know, that's the kind of armor he would have seen and been somewhat familiar with. It was a vital piece of equipment. It protected the body of a soldier the way faith protects our spirits. Uh, in Paul's metaphor, the flaming arrows of the evil one are not necessarily attempts to destroy us physically. Uh, they very well could be in some cases, but more likely uh, the arrows are meant to destroy us spiritually. In Paul's metaphor, you know, the arrows are efforts to deceive us or uh, make us fall into temptation and disable us from being effective soldiers in God's kingdom. The Roman soldiers would lock their shields in place in front of them, side by side, to make a wall as they moved forward and advanced on their enemies. If someone dropped their shield, they were a goner. The enemy, the evil one, has many different kinds of arrows, but they are all meant to either tempt us, distract us, or to make us afraid. He wants to entice us into apathy. He wants to Make us think that God doesn't really care what we do. Uh, God doesn't really care how we make decisions about our lives. He wants us to feel like we're too guilty to uh, we're too guilty for the blood of Christ to cleanse us from our sin. Faith is our shield against those kinds of arrows, and for that reason, we should make every effort to have more faith to ask for the gift, and to ask for the fruit. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. God has many ways to help us cultivate faith in our lives. Uh, for me... The process began when I first started to encounter those old ancient stories as a child, whether it was in Sunday school or children's church or most often just sitting on the couch with my parents and they were reading to me. However it was, it was the old stories that helped me to first visualize what faith was. Uh, the story of a teenage shepherd boy who stood alone on a battlefield in front of an army led by a giant and shouted defiantly at them, you come against me in the name of, sorry, you come against me with sword and spear 
and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Or the story of the three young men who refused to obey one of the most powerful kings that has ever lived by rejecting his command to bow down to a golden idol, even though they knew it meant that they might very likely die a horrible, painful death. When everyone else bowed, they stood their ground and they told the king, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then there's the story of the old man standing alone on Mount Carmel, facing off against a corrupt king and 850 of his false prophets, bowing before the Lord and praying, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Of course, there are many other stories as well that um, help us to visualize what faith looks like. Um, a few of the stories that I saw that helped me visualize faith when I was a kid uh, were even outside of the Bible. There were stories outside of Scripture that did that as well, like the one where Luke Skywalker turns off his targeting computer and trusts the Force to help him destroy the Death Star, or uh, the one where little Bilbo Baggins creeps into the underground lair and figures out how to kill the dragon, or the one where Indiana Jones has to step off the cliff when he's trying to recover the Holy Grail, or even, even when Charlie Brown lined up to kick that football anyway, just one more time knowing full well that Lucy would probably yank it away again at the last second. He committed 100%. He put all of his momentum into that run to kick that ball. I saw something about the concept of faith in a lot of fictional stories as a kid. And I saw who to put my faith in when I read the true stories in the Bible. Or when those stories were read to me. But most importantly, most importantly, I saw what faith actually looks like in real life right in front of me through my parents and through other Christians, people who walked by faith. And I still see that today. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith 
yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 40. So if you're out there somewhere, you've never taken that step of faith in following Christ, the invitation, his invitation, is always open. Every one of us has our own Death Star trench to run down. Every one of us has a dragon to kill. Every one of us has a leap of faith to make. And every one of us has our own football to kick. But Lucy isn't holding our football. The Lord, the King, the Christ, the Son of the living God is holding it. And he's looking at you in the eye. And he's saying, give it all you have. Give everything. Pick up your cross and follow me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We thank you for all the different gifts that you've given us. We pray for help to use them to bring glory to you, to uh, edify your church and to do your work. Lord, we ask for the spiritual gifts to be abundant in our church, in our fellowship, especially those of faith and wisdom and discernment. Lord, we ask that you would help each of us to know our gifts and how to use them in love and in humility. Lord, as we enter a new week, we ask for faith to overcome the obstacles in front of us, just as we ask for wisdom, guidance, protection, and health. And we pray for all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this concludes the message for Daily Chapel Christian Church for March the 24th, 2024. And this is Adam J. Kaufman signing off.